at, at uh, the San Antonio Museum of Art, Tripa also works closely with a specially trained group of, of docent facilitators to deliver multi-sensory tours uh, for visitors with visual impairments. Uh, while on hold due to the pandemic, these tours combine carefully selected sense music textures and verbal descriptions to recreate works of art through the senses. Uh, he continues to experiment with technologies such as photogrammetry and 3D printing, as well as prop making techniques uh, to further improve these experiences for people with low vision. Um, and, uh, and just from a personal note, it's been, particularly after the pandemic and stuff, it's been a while since I've been down to the M Museum of Art, uh, but to sort of make a personal plug, I find that uh, it's, it's a one, you know, wonderful facility and there's a lot of just really nice pieces in there. And, uh, and I've always found the staff has been very helpful and, and very, very courteous. So uh, if anybody has not taken an opportunity to sort of get out, you know, get some fresh air and go down to the museum, I, I would definitely encourage you to do that and to, uh, and to take advantage of that, particularly as, as the things get cooler here in the fall. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Tripp, uh, who will present the San Antonio Museum of Art. All right, thank you so much, Alan. Uh, let me get things set up here. I know that we're not all at a computer, which is totally fine, but if you are, uh, I am sharing my screen uh, and I'll be sharing some images today, uh, but never fear, I will uh, describe everything as I would uh, for a multi-sensory tour. Um, I was really pleased earlier to hear, uh, I think it was Diana said that she has been to the museum when we've had some of our multi-sensory tours. Is anyone else familiar with that program or attended some of those tours at SAMA? Just curious. All right, well, if you haven't, um, uh, we, we are hoping to bring those back. Um, they've been on pause since the pandemic, but we're hoping we can bring them back in the new year, maybe January or February. They typically occur on the first Saturday of the month. And as Alan was describing, um, they're a really cool um, program. They're very fun to, to work on and to put together because they incorporate um, many different senses. Um, so we have a collection of um, uh, like little vials that have scents, um, you know, everything from, uh, from like lemons and oranges and things you might expect to, you know, things like uh, dirt or, um, or a barn, um, all in these, these little vials. Uh, we do things with textures and objects um, that you can touch and manipulate. So uh, I hope that uh, when those are back on offer that you'll, you'll take advantage of those. Um, so I've been invited here today to share uh, uh, just a little bit of what our museum has on offer. We are what's called an encyclopedic museum, which means that we have a little bit of everything. Uh, the museum has about 35, 36,000 works of art in its collection. And it's uh, artworks from all six inhabited continents, uh, reflecting about six or 7,000 years of human history. Um, so it's artwork from all over the world, from all sorts of different time periods. So there really is a little bit of something for everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to share just one work of art with you all. Um, and we'll take our time with it and really kind of explore it carefully. Uh, and it's called Landscape of Four Seasons. Um, before we go any further, I do want to encourage your participation. If at any point you have any questions or comments, or you'd like to you know, ask kind of follow-up questions or, or seek additional details or clarification, uh, please um, don't hesitate to interrupt me even. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to pause and answer any questions or explore something further. 
Um, now, for those of us with the screen, I do want to highlight my cursor. If you're at a computer and you can see my screen, can you see the red dot? Okay, perfect. All right. So the work of art that we're going to be looking at today is, uh, as I mentioned, it's called Landscape of Four Seasons. And I'm going to start with the overall picture, a little bit of background about this piece, and then we'll kind of zoom in and I'll give a verbal description um, using as much detail as possible so that we can, we can kind of build a picture of it in our minds. So this is a large rectangular uh, work of art. It is approximately uh, 12 feet long or 12 feet wide and six feet tall. So this is a, this is a, a big uh, work of art and it is a folding screen. It's actually two separate screens that are, that are put together uh, to make one large image. Um, it comes from Japan. We don't actually have a date for it. Um, it's not. It's not certain when this was when this was made. If you ask me, it's probably somewhere between the 1600s and the early 1900s. But we're we're not sure. So, but it's probably a few hundred years old. Um, and you can tell that from the appearance of the piece because there are some places. Uh, on the the work of art that have been scuffed a little bit um, some some dings and scratches kind of on the the border of the screen um, and the the overall picture uh, that's on it that we'll explore in just a moment has has kind of yellowed a little bit over the ages which is a telltale sign of um, uh, that it's a relatively old work of art. Um, it is, uh, it's a painting, uh, but it's not your normal painting with oils or acrylics. It's an ink wash painting. So uh, what this means is, is the artist has, um, has used ink of, ver black ink of various intensities. Sometimes the ink is very thick and very dark in places. And in other places, it's very, very thin and watery and light. Um, so you get just a hint of gray or just a hint of brown in those areas. It is on paper. And um, this, this means that um, these kinds of works of art are very challenging in a way uh, because it gives you no room for error. The, the paper is very thin and absorbent and it, it'll suck up the ink right away. So there's, there's no going back once you put the brush to the paper. Um, so works like these uh, with the, um, kind of the beautiful variations in tone from dark black to light gray or brown, um, these are really the work of a master. Screens like this were commonly used in households. They're objects of daily life. Um, Japanese houses in uh, the pre-modern era, of course, did not have air conditioning, um, but they had these sliding doors kind of around the um, all four sides of the house. And so depending on the time of day or the season, uh, which way the wind was blowing, you could open up some of those doors on one side of the house to let the breeze in, keep things nice and cool. Um, but maybe you didn't want you, you didn't want the full force of the wind coming through, or maybe you were working on, um, you know, reading a book or doing your own painting or something. You didn't want things blowing around your house, so you could put up screens, folding screens like this. And that would help block some of the wind where you didn't want it, but you would still get the circulation, the fresh air. Uh, screens like this one that were painted, um, very um, detailed, these were probably articles in upper class households. These were, um, these are very fine um, decorative works of art. 
Are there any questions about the overall work of art before we dive into the details of the painting? All right, so let's take a I closer. A quick... Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, just a quick question. I guess uh, a lot of the a lot of the Japanese works were very nature oriented mm -hmm. or like individual wars and stuff. Is there, um, I guess, is that the sort of typical where the, I guess the, the particular subject matter of this, of their painting and artworks were typically uh, always sort of nature, di nature directed? Uh, when it comes to Japanese art, nature is the single most important kind of interpretive tool that we have. The seasons and seasonal imagery are um, incredibly common and incredibly important in, in Japanese art. And it's, um, it's very common, say, in our sort of imagined um, relatively wealthy household that this might have belonged to, it would be very common to change out the decorations, change out the scrolls on the wall, change out the decorative screens, um, even your uh, your dishes, perhaps, um, you would change those out with the seasons. So what's inside the household would reflect uh, the, the changes in nature that are going on outside. Um, and all of this is kind of um, focused on the uh, um, this very Japanese idea of the of impermanence, uh, that time is always passing. We're only here for a short moment. Um, so just like the seasons change, so too do we change throughout our lives, um, and uh, and nothing remains the same. So uh, we're going to take this kind of one column at a time. As I mentioned, it's two roughly square screens and uh, the screen, each of those screens fold in half. So we end up with uh, four kind of tall rectangular columns. And we're going to go as is typical in Japanese works of art and in Japanese literature, we read from right to left. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll start with the rightmost panel and move to the left and we'll work our way all the way to the left. And I'm gonna start in the foreground of each panel, describe what's in the foreground, what's in the middle ground, what's in the background, and then go to the next panel, foreground, middle ground, background, so on and so forth. And for those of us who have a screen, I'm gonna zoom way in so we can, can really see it. So in the first panel of our screen, way down in the foreground, we see a river. Um, and the, the lines that the artist has used to uh, denote the waves are very faint. So this is a very kind of calm, slow moving river. And in the foreground, there are a series of very dark black jagged rocks at the edge of this river. Moving a little bit um, towards the background, you see a wooden footbridge um, that crosses the river held up on thin bamboo stilts. And on the bridge is a lone traveler. He's walking from right to left, and he's wearing a, a long kind of white traveler's cloak. He has a broad straw hat to keep the sun out of his face, and he's also got a walking stick. Uh, this white garment that he's wearing is characteristic of uh, Buddhist um, pilgrims, so he is probably undertaking a religious pilgrimage of some sort. Uh, as he walks along the bridge to the left, he's going to come across this huge uh, rock or cliff that is jutting out of the foreground, and it kind of hangs improbably over uh, the bridge. So he'll need to pass under this, this huge kind of rocky arch to get to where he's going. On top of this steep, jagged rock formation is a little stand of trees, also kind of clinging improbably 
uh, to the top of the rock formation and exposed to the elements. A little bit to the left of our rock formation and further kind of little little distance away, it's in the middle ground, we see a, a series of buildings. Um, there is a wall around them, a white wall, and they have uh, dark gray tiled roofs. And in the center of these buildings is a little bit of a tower. It uh, looks like a building that's maybe two or three stories tall. Uh, and it has a peaked kind of pyramidal roof with some decorative finials at the edges and at the very top of the building. This is a Buddhist temple, and this is likely the destination of our traveler. Um, about this time of day, they may be preparing for evening meditation, so we might hear uh, the ringing of the large bells or, or wooden clappers that are used to summon monks uh, and other devotees to uh, evening meditation. So we move further into the background. Uh, we see um, kind of a thick layer of mist, of fog. And just barely through the fog, we can see pine trees standing way off in the distance. And as we move back and up, uh, we see massive mountains in the background. There's one that's closer to us, topped with, with bristly pine trees. And then even further in the distance, almost completely encircled in mist, is, uh, is a large, jagged mountain, almost completely obscured by the mist and the fog. Um, pointing almost like a, an index finger straight to the heavens. We're going to move to the second panel, and back to the foreground. Uh, on the near side of the river that I mentioned earlier, we've got a bit of a hill, and uh, right in the foreground and growing out of the hill, we have more kind of gnarled trees. There's a pine tree uh, growing up and to the left. And then there is what looks to me like either a plum tree or a cherry tree that's thick, jagged trunk growing nearly straight up and with little white or pink flowers weighing down all of the branches. To the left of the stand of trees is a road, and it runs uh, roughly parallel to the river that's, that's going uh, right to left across the painting. And on the road, this is very small detail, is a man riding a horse, and he's riding from left to right. This guy is probably pretty wealthy because horses were um, expensive to own and maintain. Um, back in the day, still are today, in fact. And he's, he's uh, behind him, there is another person. Um, again, this is a very small detail. It's not clear if he's an attendant, maybe following along behind, or maybe he's another traveler that uh, this man on the horse is kind of leaving behind in the dust. So we move further towards the, the middle ground. We see two boats on the river. One is smaller, like a canoe, and one is a little bit bigger, um, like almost like a river raft. And on the far side of the shore, uh, the opposite side of the river, from our perspective, is uh, another series of jagged rocks. And in some of the low-lying areas, uh, between them and around them are thick reeds. There's kind of a marshy area here. And as we move back and up, we have another uh, jagged, rugged mountain and a uh, hill that comes off of it and slopes down to the left. And on top, all of these are bristly pine trees, almost like little pipe cleaners standing straight up and down along the ridge. 
So we move further back into the background, there's yet another massive mountain. Uh, this one is large and rounded with a series of kind of uh, cliffs or overhangs uh, off to either side. We're gonna move to the second screen now. And let me, for those on a screen, I'll have the painting scooch over a little bit. So we're on the third panel now, and we're returning to the foreground. So here, the river has flown from the right where we began, and it's flown to the left, and now it's opened up into what looks like a lake or uh, possibly an inlet from the sea. And uh, on the far side of the shore, we see those dark, jagged uh, rocks that we found a couple of times throughout the painting. And uh, the, the marshy kind of sticky uh, scrub uh, that we, we noticed earlier as well. Um, just beyond that, we see signs of habitation. Uh, we see a village. There are some low kind of short broad buildings with gently sloped peaked roofs. In the windows of some of them, you can see that the curtains have been drawn. Um, the, the sliding doors I mentioned are open, so perhaps we're letting in a nice evening breeze. Um, there's a road that leads into the village. It's probably the same road that we noticed before. It's been kind of sneaking around and it crossed the river and now it's leading into the village. There are two very small people uh, walking along this, uh, this road. Uh, they're so small, it's hard to tell kind of what they're doing or what they have. Are they travelers? Are they fishermen? Are they villagers? It's not uh, very clear. The village snakes between the hills and the mountains. There is a large um, a cliff that slopes up from the village uh, gradually to towards the left, and then it drops off suddenly uh, a um, sheer cliff face towards the, uh, the inlet. Uh, there are some willows near the shore and there are also uh, two fishing boats that have come in uh, near the shore as well. As we move into the background, the landscape kind of opens up. It becomes a little bit less jagged. There are still some gently sloping hills uh, topped with those pine trees, but the landscape is now broader rather than vertical. And as we move up, we see nothing but mist and overcast skies in the background. Moving again to the fourth and final panel. Uh, we're here in the lake or the inlet. And in the foreground, closest to us, we see two more fishing boats. And they have their masts high and their sails are unfurled, and it looks like they're full of the breeze, which is a little unusual because they're, the surface of this lake or inlet to the sea is glass smooth. There's barely a wave to be seen. So we move further away, we see another boat, um, this one does not have its sails unfurled. Perhaps the fisherman on the boat is finishing up his work for the day, getting one last cast of his net in before he heads home. Uh, there's an island just beyond this boat uh, that gently slopes from the, the shallows on the right towards a small hill on the left. Beyond this island is another inlet and Way off in the background, we see a series of fishing boats heading in to the shore where uh, far, far away in the background, nestled in uh, the, 
the sloping hills of the background is another little village, just a couple of houses, maybe two or three, uh, nestled in a stand of small pine trees. Further off in the background, miles and miles away, we can see just peeking through the mist is a jagged mountain. And to the right of the mountain, rising up over the horizon and out peeking through the mist is the subtle suggestion of a pure white full moon uh, rising over the landscape. So that is our work of art. Are there any questions or comments about it? Um, any? It's so much fascinating. Has, um, has anyone tried to, uh, I guess, do a land survey to find if this was a, uh, an actual spot in uh, uh, looking at the topography and determining whether this was an actual an actual spot in, in Japan? That's a really interesting question. Um, so this particular work of art, this landscape of four seasons, is part of a um, like a tradition of painting. There are there are other paintings like this one uh, that depict these um, these kind of misty mountainous landscapes, the moon rising and the boats coming in. Um, this comes from a tradition of uh, landscape painting in this, this type from China. So uh, Japan uh, was importing works of art like this from China where this tradition began. So um, if it is a real place, it's likely based on landscapes in China. Um, uh, because Japanese artists are using these as their, their prototypes. Um, now, the other kind of complication here is that in this tradition of landscape paintings, um, artists are not particularly interested in depicting real places like they are in the Western tradition, where you can often identify specific mountains or, uh, or valleys. And sometimes you know, these paintings are, are titled, you know, with with specific places. That we had a recent special exhibition of American Impressionism, and these American landscape artists would title their paintings like Point Lobos in um, uh, near uh, Carmel, California. That's not the case with these Asian landscapes. The most important thing was to capture a mood or a feeling or an idea rather than a specific place or a specific time. So with that in mind, what, what kind of mood or feeling were you able to get kind of pick up on from this work of art? Any thoughts? To me, it's a very peaceful scene. Very peaceful. What what about it was was kind of contributing for you to that that sense of peacefulness? Well, just kind of the whole thing, the water and like someone you said someone probably going on a pilgrimage, and it mm -hmm. just seems it just seemed like a very serene, very peaceful scene. Yeah, um, the one of the things for me that that I, I think I would agree with you that that gets that across is, is the water. Um, we have this river that is, it seems to be moving from right to left into this, uh, this larger body of water. And there's hardly a wave to be seen. There are some very, very faint suggestions of, um, with, with really thin ink lines um, mm -hmm. that suggest that it's, you know, it's water, but it's, it's like, it's hardly moving at all. It's very calm and placid. Oh, very still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, anyone like else? Any other impressions? Or Diana, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just, I just really like the way that you described it because I'm, I'm not seeing it at all. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate the way you were able to describe it. And the music in the background, I think that really added to it. 
Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on the music here in a second, uh, but I'm glad you, you noticed that as well. Um, any other impressions or, or feelings uh, that um, we I, were? Yeah. I, I just had a quick question. I, mm -hmm. I, I heard all the uh, descriptions of the uh, landscape and stuff, but I didn't actually hear if you actually mentioned what the seasons were in each one. So I'm assuming it's spring, summer, fall, winter, going right to left. Well, that's the weird thing um, that I think kind of about this is because it's not um, the it's a oops I'm sorry it's a it's a contiguous landscape, um, and so it's the I don't think that the divisions are that stark um, per se. You know, like one panel is spring, one is summer, one is fall. I think they're kind of the the references to the seasons are kind of mixed up throughout the painting. So if I go uh, back a little bit, um, I mentioned in our second panel, it looked like we had either a plum tree or a cherry tree with its uh, strong, thick uh, trunk and the branches are heavy laden with these white or pink flowers. It's it's hard to tell if they're white or pink because the artist is not really using any color. It's just black or brown ink. Um, the cherry tree in particular is a dead giveaway that it's spring. Um, the cherry trees in Japan, and we actually have some here in the US as well, namely in uh, uh, Washington DC, um, Japan gifted some cherry trees to the United States government. Uh, they bloom with these thick, brilliant, uh, or thick, like kind of soft pink blossoms for only about two weeks out of the entire year around March. Um, so uh, these become very closely associated with springtime in Japanese culture. The pine trees, are usually a reference to, and we have pine trees all over the place, kind of, I mentioned them standing like little uh, little uh, brush, um, uh, brush, uh, what's the, um, like bottle hey. brushes on the, hey. uh, on the ridges. Uh, these are, um, the pine trees are one of the three friends of winter. It's one of the, uh, the emblems of the winter time, you know, although things get dark, things get bleaker, uh, life becomes harder in the winter, colder, more difficult, the pine tree is always green. It always endures. Uh, so this is a, becomes a symbol of human fortitude, human resilience, and a, a symbol of the winter. In the third panel, we um, kind of I think I forgot to mention these actually, but just beyond the village that's on the shores of the lake are uh, what look to me like some willow trees. Uh, they have, they kind of uh, grow up and out over the water and they have these very fine uh, hair-like uh, branches and they, they hang down towards the water. Uh, willows are often associated with the summer. Um, and um, the fall, I have not, for the life of me, been able to find uh, a reference to the fall. I'm sure it's here someplace, but um, I just haven't picked up on it yet. So, so there, there are these nods to the four seasons, and it's like they're all kind of coexisting at the same time. Um, Larry, I see that you've got your hand up, yes. First of all, great, great job of describing. That's so much detail and you really handled it very well. So thank you, thank you. congratulations. I have an observation that is kind of contrary to uh, the way to look at these um, mm -hmm. windows. You know, it, it seems to me that if you move from left to right, you are actually looking at a, first of all, the, the larger uh, panorama. And then as you're moving to the right, it gets more and more specific mm. until you're finally at the point where you see the uh, gentleman, I guess, uh, 
who is going to the Buddhist temple for for prayer time. So, mm-hmm. it, I, I I don't know is is that a incorrect observation of moving from the from the larger picture of showing several villages, several fishing boats, etc. And, and then kind of getting smaller and smaller in your focus until the rightmost uh, picture, which shows just one person. No, I don't, I don't think so at all. The, the reason that I personally went from right to left is because uh, this is how um, narrative scenes in Japanese works of art and how um, literature is is written in Japan. It, it goes from right to left, kind of the opposite direction of what we're accustomed to. But I, you know, there is is obviously, as you just demonstrated, more than one way to go about looking at a work of art. And, and I have to imagine that Japanese viewers would do the same thing, you know, look at it going one way, you know, imagine that you, you live in a house where this is displayed. Maybe you're, you're walking through a room and you walk past it going right to left. And then you go the other direction on your way back through the house from the left to the right. You're going to, you're going to view it in, in different ways and look at these panels in different sequences. So I think that's a really interesting observation. The, that idea from like the macro where we have, the many villages, the broad landscape, the even references to the heavens, the celestial bodies, you know, way out there. And it it becomes kind of smaller and more intimate as you get closer mm-hmm. to the left. You have that Buddhist temple and it's, uh, you know, it, it, you can even think kind of metaphorically the, the focus of Buddhist teaching on inward reflection and the soul pilgrim going on this, this journey of um, of discovering the self, um, it goes from cosmic to internal, um, and then if you go the other way, it goes from internal to cosmic. So um, yeah, I, I mean that's a, a really great point that I think different things can kind of come out of the work just depending on how you look at it, how you interact with it, which way you move. Has do you have any other paintings by the same artist, and do they f- kind of follow a similar uh, sequence? Uh, well, we don't know who this artist is. Oh. Um, this is it's it's quite unusual that this hasn't been signed. Um, normally, Japanese and Chinese artists, uh, painters, poets uh, would sign their work with a red stamp. Uh, that would uh, um, uh, it would it would give either their given name or their artist's name. We don't have that in this case. There there are no inscriptions whatsoever, which is uh, a, l- a little bit unusual. Um, so we're not we're not a hundred percent sure who the artist is and um, what other works we could compare it to. But we do have other say screens in in our collection. Um, they're just across the gallery from this one, if you were to, to go to the museum, is a um, uh, is a multi-panel screen depicting scenes from the 11th century novel, uh, The Tale of Genji from Japan. And these are also read um, kind of in the sequence of events in the novel, roughly right to left. Um, uh, there are actually two, two separate screens that depict um, different episodes from the tale of Genji and they're, they're kind of the same way. So, um, but there, there are other screens. Um, we have some beautiful screens now in the Japanese gallery depicting those um, cherry trees with their, their, pale pink blossoms. And those um, those are kind of agnostic about how you approach them. It, it doesn't really matter if you go from right to left or top to bottom or bottom to top or, or the other way around, backwards, forwards. Um, it's uh, in, in those instances, 
uh, it's just kind of pure natural imagery and um, and there's not necessarily like a narrative there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Any other, I know that we've, we've gone a, a bit longer than I think we anticipated, but you all had some great questions and, and comments. Were there, are there any final reflections or, or questions, comments about this work of art? This may be something that's sort of related to maybe Japanese art. Um, I guess the, the idea of interpretation, um, I mean, from a, like a Western standpoint, depending, well, depending upon the, when we're talking about is sometimes they, um, they, they craft their art and with a specific idea to, to communicate. Others would craft it and, and uh, want the observer to interpret it on their own. Um, so it, what matters is what you interpret, how you interpret it. Um, in terms of the Japanese art, like, like something like this, you know, is the artist generally trying to convey an interpretation that he wants the, the, the observer to, to, to draw or is it done in such a way that, uh, that you know, they expect the observer to, to draw their own interpretation? I think it's more of the latter than, than the former. It's, it's more about conveying a mood or, or a feeling than a specific idea. Um, so in other words, there's, there's not really a wrong way to interpret this. Um, as we, we kind of explored uh, following Larry's comment, um, the, the key thing uh, behind works of art like this is, is the affective element, the, you know, how do you as a viewer respond to this painting? How do you feel when you look at it? Do you feel calm? Do you feel melancholy? Do you feel, um, uh, um, do you feel like you want to go on a Buddhist pilgrimage? You know, um, there, there are many ways that you can um, react to a piece, a piece like this. Um, and uh, in fact, in, in a lot of Asian works of art, um, you see this demonstrated very vividly, uh, particularly on things like hand scrolls, these really long kind of painted um, scrolls uh, that depict often similar landscapes. And we actually, we have some in our collection. And the really neat thing about them is that, um, that these scrolls were, were collected and traded and bought and sold, you know, numerous times throughout their lifetimes. And different people owned them at different times. And it was not uncommon for different owners or even different viewers, you know, friends of the owners. Um, they would spend time, you know, looking at and enjoying these works of art, and they would feel so moved by them that they would write a short poem right on the painting um, about what it reminds them of, or their experience of looking, or the kind of the feelings, the emotions that arise for them as they, they've looked at the artwork. And then they would, they would stamp it with their red seal. So uh, some works of art will be covered in these kinds of inscriptions that do not belong to the original artist there, uh, but they record um, the various responses um, to the works of art by different viewers and different owners. Um, that's not the case with this one. Like I said, there are no inscriptions, um, which is a little bit unusual, but um, in other similar works of art, that's definitely the case. Um, I have one more question. Sure. Um, you said that this was being in the house of someone of means. Would this have been like a commissioned or is this something that they would have like acquired in some other way? Um, it, it could have been like either or. Um, you know, Japanese artists uh, would produce, um, you know, works of art for sale for commercial purposes and scenes like this were always popular you know they would sell so um that that is a possibility but it's it's just as likely that perhaps um a a prospective buyer approached an artist and said i would like 
a scene of the you know the, the landscape of the four seasons um because this this was a um kind of it, its own little subgenre so um this is something that you could certainly ask for that you could certainly commission um we don't know a lot about the the history of the ownership of of this piece unfortunately All right. The um, one final thing is uh, some of you may have noticed the music kind of playing softly in the background. Uh, there were two instruments that you you might have heard. Uh, one was a bamboo flute, a traditional Japanese bamboo flute called the shakuhachi. Um, it's made from a length of a bamboo. Um, and in fact, the um, uh, if you were to see or feel a shakuhachi and you you ran your uh, hands along the length of it, you would actually feel the little bumps, the the nodules where the bamboo uh, segments begin and end. So it's um, it's a it's like a piece of bamboo straight from the forest, chopped to a certain length. Um, there are only five holes drilled into it, so you get a um, a minor pentatonic scale of just five notes. Um, but you can get a, a wide range of, um, of pitches depending on how you blow across the end of it, which you may have heard uh, in the music. And the second instrument that uh, you might have heard was a uh, shamisen, which is, has sometimes been described as a traditional Japanese banjo. It has this kind of percussive twangy sound. It's a stringed instrument with a rectangular sound box and a very kind of thin, long uh, neck uh, with only three strings and three tuning pegs at the end. And it's played with a um, very broad kind of triangular plectrum or pick that's used to uh, slap and uh, pick the strings and the surface of the shamisen. So you get this, um, the not only the sound of the strings, but also a, a kind of percussion sound as this is, um, the plectrum is, is manipulated against the surface of the shamisen. So that too is a uh, traditional Japanese instrument. Um, and in fact, just kind of an interesting point of trivia about the shamisen is that um, uh, the shamisen is often associated with um, uh, with blind bards. Um, there, there was a um, uh, with a belief. Uh, there was a belief that um, if uh, if someone was born without sight, lost their sight, that they uh, could become particularly attuned to this kind of instrument. And so the shamisen was frequently practiced by, um, by people with low or limited vision. And they might travel from place to place and, and play uh, this instrument for people. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of what we try to do with our multi-sensory tours. Now, um, we've only been able to to use kind of our, our mind's eye and our, um, our hearing. We, we often try to integrate music and these ekphrastic descriptions, as well as um, when we're in person, of course, smells and, and textures and touch objects. So when we do um, launch those again, we hope that you'll, um, you'll join us for those, for those programs. Um, but it's been a real pleasure uh, being invited to share uh, this work of art, a little little bit of our museum with all of you. Uh, you can find out more about us at essaymuseum.org. Uh, 